So John, we're recording now. What What's the name of this poem again? Well, it's not a poem. It's a, a prose piece uh, that I call an Iris uh, Manifesto. And actually, uh, half of it is the story of my 15th year in the hills, and the other, the other half is an essay to the memory of this young fellow that I met up there in Baxter County, and who volunteered first when the Korean War broke out and was killed right at the beginning. Huh. I found out about that nine years later after I'd left Baxter County and came back from the Army myself. And that's part of the reason that I believe in nonviolence and no war. No war. A dream we'd like to see in our lifetime. But we won't. Uh, well, go ahead and read some more of it. I've enjoyed it. Okay. That first morning at Hilltop, I stepped out into a stark wintry scene. All around lay a wide horizon of crisscross timbered ridges outlined in snow, with the dark blue dragon of the rising lake sprawled in the midst. Two channels joined the main lake body, the old river course coming from the north, a second arm from the northwest. Nearer the dam, a pale blue heart of ice dusted with snow floated in the center. A broad band of bleached and logged off land bordered all the lake water. Then the roar of the work site drew me. I, chill air burned my cheeks as I ran to the ridge end to gaze at the scene below. Blue arc lights sparked and sputtered, yellow showers of welding sparks sailed off. Spaced rebar rods jutted from gray concrete. Taut cables quivered as they hoisted and lowered gigantic dripping dump buckets. Men in domed hard hats swarmed everywhere, and far below, monster Euclid jump dump trucks roared into the mixing towers and roared away. I squinted. Somewhere in all that moving swarm, Dad was working. Impossible to pick him out. The noisy, violent action on the half-built dam contrasted starkly with the area just down the street. Here, everything stood still. No sign of life was left on the flat gravel plain across the shrunken river except a fringe of bare trees and vines along the water's edge. Even the water looked different, stagnant but glass clear, above a black river bottom. Curious, I clung to a sapling and leaned out to stare down the almost sheer drop. Maybe early work on the dam side had cut the river off, creating a stagnant lagoon that filled with algae and then dried up, turning the dying algae black and coating the rocky riverbed. Recent rain or snow melt had filled the pool again, causing patches of dead black algal mat to break loose and float to the top. It looked awful. Nearer the dam, a grid of concrete dragon's teeth had been cast in the bottom. Some kind of white coating from the teeth striped the dark bottom with even parallel bars below the grid. Youth is resilient. Despite my sadness at leaving Harrison, what I saw here made me eager to explore. The heavily timbered ridges, the natural ledges, and even blasted and exposed rock revived my hunger for hunting crystals and geodes, fossils, and primitive projectile points. Well, the next sunny day, the snow melted fast, and I took a path down to look to the lake arm, where I found a spectacular tusk-shaped fossil, actually a sea creature, a sea creature they identified later from a guidebook, but I lost it from a hip pocket on the way back. No amount of frantic searching turned it up. On that east side, no road yet reached the dam side. A few days later, TM moved us to Salesville, a mile or so west of the dam. on the single gravel access road. At first, at first we rented an unfinished pool hall or general store building, part of the worker village. The village itself, Ellis, was a few unpainted cabins with only electricity. For the two years following, my two small brothers and I attended the one-room school at Salesville. The pupils were partly local, partly dam workers' children. Their in-class behavior surprised me. Spitball fights and brazen flirting went on constantly despite the young woman teacher's best efforts at control. This era of hijinks ended one Friday when an amorous older boy was forced to stand and recite with an obvious erection in his jeans. On Monday, we had a new teacher. 
The school board sent a man to finish out the term. Mr. Banks was 40-ish of sturdy physique and arrived with two heavy hickory whipping rods. Maybe they were to cow us. To my knowledge, he never used them. Daily, Mr. Banks demonstrated directness, sincerity, concern, and humor. Years later, I felt real loss when his obituary appeared in the main state newspaper. I clipped it to add to the death notices I keep about exemplary lives, like that of a Little Rock lawyer who handled civil rights cases pro bono. Mr. Banks taught me a lot, aside from his use of whipping rods. I now face the task of dealing justly with Harold and Zach, who seem to be polar opposites. I knew too little about each one of them, but will strive for a clear look at each. Every life deserves that. So, first, Zach Vickers. It will be hard for me to view him fairly since I instinctively despised him from the first. This young man is a local legend for his hell raising and his drunken mishaps, for the marks and bruises on his wife. They had two small boys and lived in a tiny white shotgun house, probably hauled in when Zach came to work at the dam. My stepmother once sent me to ask Mrs. Vickers about ration stamps or the like, but I recall only my shock as I, she stood on the stoop and talked to me, oblivious of a blue half moon under an eye and a crusted cut on a cheekbone. I was 12, but had never seen marks of family fights on a human face. Staring, I felt dirty and ashamed. I wondered that she would let it be seen. On the other hand, his fellow workers at the dam were big fans of Zack. His jokey, rebellious ways fascinated them. He was their own crazy jackanapes, furnishing no stories that always began. Did you hear what that damn Zack just did? Even TM went on jaunts with him, frog hunting on the lake right after their work shift ended. Dad came home the first time laughing. That sucker was drunk when he climbed in the boat. We, he turned her over three times, and every time we had to splash around, turn her back, rock out some water, drag her up and dump the rest, and then get the motor started. Last time, though, we were in deeper water. The seal beam headlight and car battery went down to nine feet of water. It was shining way down there. And I had to dive down, grab the battery, and stand on a stump to hold it high enough for them to reach it. He finished with helpless laughter and head wagging. This made me wonder why Dad would go out with him at all, and what about us, the family, if something really bad happened? Anyway, I knew too much about Zach's shenanigans. Zach was all fault to me. My first contact alone with Zach came on a misty Saturday morning of our second spring there during the white bass spawning run. Fishing gave me my chief joy and solace in our family wanderings. Fishing alone was natural. No one ever worried about me that way. Over the space of a year or two, my love of fly fishing grew into making my own lures. Dad pleased me by buying me a cheap fly rod to replace my homemade one. My lure that morning was a crudely tied tuft of white goat hair behind a pearl shirt button. Angling action in the short time I'd been there was so fast it blotted out all else. The unfinished dam still blocked off the river in the spawning run, but milky water from recent rains was pouring in from two small feeder streams below the dam and white bass lay massed in ranks in the creek mouths. At first I cast carefully, but slashing strikes soon had me landing fish and flinging the lure back fast. At least twice I hooked three fish on one retrieve, the first two tearing loose and landing the third. More than once the gleaming pinstripe fish struck so hard they ripped the line from my fingers after over half an hour of this heady excitement. High drama for a kid my age, I came to and stopped and checked my stringer and washed my hands. I'd landed and released at least 20, keeping only six, the ones that all hurt. Plenty for the family, they were fine fish, but rock bass taste even better. As I wiped my hands and stood up to hike home, I noticed a single figure coming down the feeder stream bank outlined against the bare gravel plain left with the dozers. At that distance, I couldn't recognize the face, but the swaggering gait told me it must be Vickers coming to spo spoil my thoughtless joy. Anyone would do as a target for his bragging. He carried a fly rod in one hand, a wet bulging toe sack in the other. I hoped he might go past, but he walked right down to the rocky spit where I stood a big smirk on his bony face. He asked how I'd done. Silently, I held up my stringer. In turn, he opened his sack for me to glance in at perhaps three dozen fine fish, mostly milky-eyed and dead. Hell, I don't like fish myself. Don't even eat them. I just throw them away. He gave a snort of laughter and stared at me. 
I stared angrily back. Even though TM didn't always follow his own code, he taught me not to kill for the sake of killing, not to torment living things, never to waste or take more than needful. After a moment, I muttered something about nice fish and got away fast. From that time, I carefully avoided it. I first met Harold Lambert in the fall of 1945 after I'd finished eighth grade at the Salesville School and would begin high school at Norfolk, the old pioneer trading post town a few miles off where the North Fork met the larger White River. On the first day, I hiked a quarter mile up to Salesville to wait at the general store, a white frame building squatting in the wide and gravel junction. Other kids were waiting there for our ride, a few from nearby. Others dropped by their dads on the way to work. Only Harold came on foot from any distance. His home was on the far side of the dam. We climbed into the covered bed of the pickup used as a school bus and sat on wooden benches along the sides. The driver's daughter rode up front with him. We were about 10 back there. Bob Black and his sister Lilybeth, Jack Rose and his sister Earlene, all older. Harold was my age, along with two of the girls, a plump freckled blonde and a sharp-chinned brunette who smoked. There was a thin, freckled brother of the plump blonde. I don't remember the other. As soon as the truck kicked gravel and pulled out, first Bob, then Jack, Harold, and I climbed out quickly onto the bumper and stood with our heads above the tarp cover out of the dust and exhaust. The driver had warned us against this. Of the rest, only feisty Lilybeth tried it a bit, ordering brother Bob out of the way. The truck rolled down the gravel highway as a ridge sloped toward the meeting of the rivers, the North Forks Canyon converging from the left where a final cliff dropped sheer beyond the road's edge. The truck rattled over the highway bridge next to the railway one and coasted down the block or two of shops, the only pavement and street lights for miles around, then straight into the school grounds. We hopped off and the girls climbed cautiously out. The driver came past, tugged at his cap bill, grinned at us, and walked back toward the Blue Moon Cafe.